Okay, great. Uh, I think we are live. Sorry for the for the slight delay. Uh, those things tend to happen. Uh, so let's immediately start. Uh, and I will just, I guess, accept uh, challenges uh, rather uh, randomly today. So uh, let's go. I will play e4. In general, I think uh, if I get the chance, I will try to uh, play uh, e4 with white and play the Roy Lopez uh, and try to follow my course recommendations there. And that's black against d4. Of course, uh, I will play the Magnus Queen's Gambit, which I very recently released a course about. Uh, so that's what you can expect if you play this, uh, these openings. Unfortunately, I haven't really uh, made a complete repertoire, neither for white nor black. So uh, uh, I will not be able to follow my own recommendations all the time. But I will do it when I can. But for this game, ah, we are playing 3 plus 0. Ooh. Should be a little bit faster than. I don't think I have played without increment for uh, for quite a while. Uh, in general, yeah, I, I mean, but any any time control is fine if you challenge me. I don't really care that much. Now oh, well, I will go for the so-called uh, Fisher or Velimirovich attack, the Fisher attack I call it because Fisher was the one who introduced or played it the most at the highest level uh, because Fisher's. Anniversary of his match with Spassky was very recently, so makes sense to do some uh, some of his openings, I think. Hmm. Not so much is going on. I'm trying to attack. Now I'm considering maybe to take on, on e6. Why not? It's always very... I've, uh, I'm always so tempted to sacrifice whenever possible here. Let's try it. Uh, mm. So I'm getting two pawns, but I'm also getting quite uh, quite good pieces. The bishop on uh, on e7 is a bit loose, uh, and also black's counterplay is very slow. That's why I think it's it's quite fine, even if I don't, you know, sort of give mate immediately. I'm just going to play f4 and going to push my pawn slowly. Uh, I hope. Of course, uh, a piece could also be quite valuable, and. Uh, in a, in a classical game, I, I doubt that I would sacrifice uh, like that. But I think for Blitz, it's much easier to be white in these positions. So no, not too concerned. Okay, so what should he try to do? I guess he should yeah move this knight exactly. Move the knight. Try to trade off as many as many pieces as possible. And I should try to avoid that if I can. It's not so easy. Maybe I'll try to just make some confusing moves. Probably it was better to take on c8, but uh, so far black is playing quite well. Uh, not sure about my uh, objective compensation, let's say. But my practical compensation are still, uh, is still uh, quite good, I think. Mm. So, but it's uh, it's always weird these positions. I, to be honest, I never, I never really understood them uh, like in depth. Like when is it nice compensation with a with one or two pawns for the piece, and when are you just uh, completely like basically pieced down? Now I have at least three pawns, so materially speaking, I'm okay. Uh, but the question is if maybe black can start some attack, like knight a4, then queen b4 is is looming. Could be quite uh, quite unpleasant, queen b4. Or is it, is it really? Hmm. Well, so I don't have that much time. Let's try to make it as confusing as possible for the both of us. Queen before my intention is is to go bishop d4. So I cover this fork on c3, knight c3 check. And also if my rook is captured, then I have bishop takes g7. And the rook on d6 is uh, well, I will win the queen on d6, let's say. So here I think I'm I'm safe. Uh, and if I'm safe like long term, I think my pieces are or my pawns are uh, more valuable than than black's pieces. Should be because like my pawns are in the center. I have some f6. The king on h8 is long term very weak, I think. So uh, uh, I think black really should try to do something very fast in order to, uh, in order to get counterplay. And now it's super messy. 
Let's see. So rook takes. I think I have to go for some sort of counterplay, I guess. Problem for black now is that g7 is very hard to, uh, to defend. Uh, like if the rook defends, like rook f7 or rook g, then I can simply take on d8 and the rook is overloaded. So I think this might have been uh, been a winning move. But <laughs> I mean, such positions are very, very tricky. Uh, let's see. Uh, I will be trying to keep track of, of the chat in uh, uh, in all the places, so just 24 YouTube and Twitch, but it's it's a little bit tricky. Uh, queen takes d4 was played, but that's pretty hopeless because now I'm simply a queen up. Uh, yeah, my thoughts, let's just start a new game and I will continue to talk, see if... Let's play a Norwegian, our brother country. No, I'm black. So if d4, I promise to play d5, d6, a6. My course, Agnes Queen's Gambit. What, what are my thoughts about uh, the FTX Road to Miami tournament, like the current uh, uh, tour tournament? Uh, not that much, actually, because to be honest, I haven't had... Uh, oh, this guy is maybe not here. Ah, he doesn't have this green uh, green dot. I will abort this. I will have to accept people with only, only the green dot. Let's play Dangerous Ride. Now I got white again. Yeah, I haven't had much time. Actually, yesterday I played an over-the-board blitz tournament. That's very rare for me, but uh, that's what I did. Uh, so I didn't really have... It took all evening, or all day and all evening, so I didn't have time to follow. And uh, yeah, before that, there was also the Bundesliga. So yeah, not so much. I was a bit surprised that, uh, for instance, uh, Dominguez didn't qualify because I consider him a very, very strong player. But it seems like uh, uh, he's probably stronger over the board than, than online, is my impression. But still, a little bit surprising. Otherwise, uh, yeah, not much, uh, not much to be to be said about that tournament. Uh, for me, unfortunately, I simply haven't had. Uh, I simply haven't uh, looked at it that much. Let's see. Can I play some e5 here? Uh, it would be a very typical move. Let's do it. I will try to go for the ending. Mm. Let's see. Yeah, and recently we have uh, in Sweden. I'm from. I'm. I'm in Copenhagen, Denmark currently, and I'm from living in Denmark, but. Uh, uh, I'm of course Swedish, and uh, recently the Swedish Championship finished, which I didn't uh, didn't play in. Uh, but it was won by uh, none other than Johnny Hector, the legendary Swedish uh, grandmaster who has been uh, playing professional chess for more than thirty years. He used to be um, a twenty six hundred player back in the days, and uh, an expert of uh, of open tournaments and many many famous nice uh, crazy attacking games mainly. It's always a very entertaining player to watch. And he won, finally. Uh, last time he won was uh, exactly 20 years ago. So that was, uh, that was very nice to see. The old guard still uh, able to fight back against the youth. Last time a 19-year-old won, and now a 58-year-old, I think. So, so that was nice to see. Uh, but I haven't played the Swedish Championship myself for, in, for quite a while. It's simply more interesting for me to play against uh, the stronger opposition, basically. So I'd rather play against some world-class player in, in the Bundesliga, for instance, which I did last year, than, uh, this year, than, uh, than take part in, uh, in the Swedish Championship. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty normal uh, for players in sort of from smaller countries like, uh, like Sweden. So here... The rook on b8 is again a little bit overloaded. Like if black had one more move for let's say bishop b7 before I could move uh, my knight, the two bishops would give back uh, a very pleasant edge. Uh, but here it looks like the rook on b8 will not be able to to keep the c8 bishop defended. So I'm by very tactical means I'm uh, I'm winning probably. As strategically, I'm, my position is quite lousy. But it's the Sicilian, and in the Sicilian, the concrete play is usually very important. So, uh, let's see.
Looking forward to 2042. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, another. Now, if Johnny wins in 2042, like I. I would say even if he plays in 20 years, it would be super impressive. Then he would be 78. I'm not sure how many how many players can qualify for the top group in the national championships at, uh, at 78. Uh, I think already winning this year was super impressive by him. Mm, now I should maybe be a little bit careful that I'm not getting my knight trapped. But I always have the move a5 in worst case to stabilize the knight it wasn't it wasn't the idea of a4 i wanted to take but uh, now i see that my knight is trapped so i will have to defend it with a5 on the next move uh i takes there but then um, probably knight takes a4 still it's not i mean i'm a clear exchange up i have a, a rook for a bishop uh, but two bishops against rook and knight is really very clear and if black had I don't know, let's say Black had a pawn here, so he would still be material down, but then I think Black would simply be better because the two bishops are so strong in such a position. But without a single pawn and with so few pieces on the board, I, I have to believe that I'm uh, I'm winning here. Also, now I'm able to trade the rooks because there is rook c7 uh, if, the, if the rook moves. Or is there? Okay, I missed this one. <laughs> let's see, a bit... Uh... A bit rusty, perhaps. But okay, with the pin, I guess the rook trade will come eventually. Uh, I wanted knight c5, but this was stopped. Excellent move by my opponent. Let's try it the slow way. Basically, if I could trade any of his pieces, I am completely winning. It's not so easy to achieve. Also, but my opponent has one second. So. Uh, long term, I should have some chances. Say knight b3. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go on. Let's take some. Uh, let's play with Zevich. By the way, an excellent feature that. Uh, I will try to play, actually. I, I haven't made any course against 1e4, but uh, I will try to play the Royal Opus, but with black, if I get the possibility. So, hopefully, by studying an opening for one color, you will also be able to play it a little bit better from, from the other side as well. I hope so. Uh, if I won the Swedish Championship, yes, I did win once. Uh, it was in 2015 or 16, I think. Uh, and I did play once or or twice, twice maybe after that as well, but then then I had enough. Uh, I actually won a tiebreak against Emmanuel Berg. Very dramatic tiebreak. I was winning. Like, I was leading with one point before the last round. Uh, but then I was black against Emmanuel, who was trailing me by one point, and he played the King's Gambit with white. So, <laughs> completely unsound, completely crazy. Uh, I did not really punish him. Like, I wasn't able to punish him. but. Uh, I got an uh, acceptable position, rather equal, and uh, finally in some long rook ending, he ground me down from the King's Gambit. Then we had to play a tiebreak, which I eventually won. But uh, that was... Uh, I don't want to take. It's always dangerous when you take, because then some e sorry, some e5 will break open. I will try to keep it closed. <laughs> okay, I, was not, I didn't realize that uh, it was perhaps a controversial uh, statement that King's Gambit is unsound, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, to me, it always seemed, at least, let's say, not the most solid opening. Uh, but I think for a must-win situation, uh, not so bad. I mean, we also remember Magnus Carlsen beating the incredibly solid Chinese player Wang Ye, specifically with the King's Gambit. Uh, I think back in 2000, what, nine, probably, if I recall correctly. I'm not 100% uh, sure. Mm. Okay, let's hit the bishop. Hope that he takes, then I will get the bishop here. Of course, he doesn't. Oh, they, they, they don't. Knight c6. Uh, I want to put my, I mean, I wanted to play bishop g4 and put my knight on d7, but I was afraid if I play bishop g4, then some, some e5 would come. Didn't look that convincing. So now I'm trying to stop e5 and go bishop g4 on the next move. So not allowing this e5. 
And in general, white has a slight space advantage, but my pieces are all very harmoniously placed. I have like rook e8 pressure on the e pawn, and particularly this pawn on c3 is very annoying. Like, if white could play knight c3, think it's possible probably to argue that white is slightly better, but here all my pieces are uh, so well placed, and black, white's uh, white is lacking some harmony. Also, the queen on d3 is not perfect. Uh, it can become a little bit vulnerable, or at least I can threaten it. So there are some small, like it's it's quite subtle, but uh, some small nuances that makes uh, my position completely fine. I think. Uh, What do I think about uh, the neither of opening? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there is of course this this history with uh, with me and the neither. Uh, I mean, uh, like in in the Vikings Vi tournament last year, twenty twenty one, uh, I did lose a couple of games in the neither, and I did lose them uh, while following Anish's chessable course, and it all got quite uh, quite famous. It was a bit weird. Uh, people forget that I also had uh, one more game before that in the same tournament where I got a completely winning position with the Nidorf. So it's not uh, exclusively, uh, I mean, it's not completely terrible, the, the opening. Uh, and I'm I'm still, okay, the, I, it was it was a bit rough losing all those games, but I'm still a big fan of the Nidorf in general. Uh, definitely. Hmm. And I'm still a big fan of Anish's course. I think actually the course is, uh, is of excellent uh, quality. That's for sure. Mm. Let's see. Should I take? Should I go back? Probably I should go back all the way. I'm going all the way because I want to keep the d6 pawn protected. Uh, but I'm not sure this is correct. But if I get knight h5 and some knight f4, uh, I should be doing fine. And uh, the bishop on g3, and also I get some kingside initiative. Again, the queen is a little bit unpleasantly placed on e2 because this f4 square is weak. Uh, any plans of resuming streaming? No, probably not, actually. I mean, I was streaming for not that long. Only a couple of months, actually. Uh, well, I, I did enjoy it, but uh, yeah, it's simply a question of uh, of time for me. Like I, I enjoy streaming, but I enjoy uh, studying chess and playing chess even more. And uh, as far as I can tell, or as far as it has been so far, there is simply not enough time for both. Uh, and then I will, of course, pick the, the one that I prefer the most. And now my opponent started to pre-move. But I think... By now, I should be a bit better because of the bishop pair. Ah, now it's a pawn. So, thank you for the game. Uh, let's play. I will try now to play one game with uh, with increment. Let's play. Ah, that's it. This is an excellent uh, nickname. D4, D5, C4, E6. Let's see if he plays it. Then, if especially if you play after D5, E6, you follow up with A6. But he doesn't play. What is this? I thought his handle is clearly indicated, but maybe he likes it only for white. That is strange. <laughs> now he plays the Dutch. Let's play the bishop f4 system. Not to be mixed up with the London system. Well, it's some sort of London, I guess, technically, but uh, it's very different when uh, when black has played f5. Then I think the bishop is excellently placed on, uh, on f4. Mm, let's see. Okay, in these positions, it's always a big question for white. Should you play h3? Or should you allow black to play knight h5 and knight x f4? But in my experience, especially in blitz, if you don't play h3, they anyway don't play knight h5. So, like, uh, even if perhaps you should play h3, like, I would recommend not to bother because uh, anyway, black players are not uh, too keen on knight h5. I think in in maybe in classical chess, you are more likely to face this uh, this move. Let's see. So my plan, like in general, the plan with this move. So at some point play c5, and then this pawn chain is supposed to get uh, weakened. Uh, but it should be timed well because b6 makes black able to take with a b pawn. Uh, 
And then the like even push e5 after I take it back, sorry. So that's cannot be the plan. Mm. And maybe this knight can be moved. Sometimes this knight is moved. Is it here? Maybe here. So, and the bishop is actually excellent on f3 when uh, when black has played b6. That's the downside of b6. So but it's nice to be able to spend half a minute not being worried about getting flagged because of this increment. <laughs> mm, let's see. Uh, might be this, uh, but this is a little bit. Now things are getting a bit vulnerable for black because the rook is hanging, and if it moves, it might be five. Surprisingly, attacks two pawns, and they cannot both be defended. Uh, it looks like I'm winning a pawn, actually, quite an important pawn. Mm. What about the Yanish Gambit, or the Schliemann Gambit, as it's also called? Uh, well, it was popular for a little while. I think yeah, Radyabov was actually the one who uh, reintroduced it at top level back in, I don't know, could it have been 15 years ago, maybe? Uh, and then it looked fun for a little while, but uh, yeah, basically, I think it's not unsound. Uh, but there are a couple of lines for white where you can get uh, some advantage. And more importantly, uh, in those lines where white is slightly better against the Yanish, uh, white is usually also very, very safe. Like um, black does not get this nice counterplay uh, that you're hoping for when playing a move like f5. You actually generally just have to defend a slightly worse, quite symmetrical position or... Are some uh, actually also quite frequently you give a pawn for some opposite colored uh, bishop positions where you are trying to make it draw and uh, uh, I simply I mean it's I would say boring perhaps even slightly depressing rather than uh, rather than bad because bad I think is too strong I cannot really say that it's bad let's see here I will try to establish this knight on c6 so yesterday in this blitz tournament. Uh, one of the players, by far the most famous player, wasn't me, not at all, was uh, the legendary Swedish grandmaster Ulf Andersson. Uh, and I came to think about him because his favorite piece in the game is definitely a knight on c6. He has won uh, many, many games, especially in the Catalan opening, exclusively because of a knight on c6. So uh, that's why it feels nice now to have the knight there. Let's see. So I'm a pawn up, but it's an A pawn, so it's not the most uh, valuable pawn. Uh, the more important thing here is whether I will be able to uh, attack the center and break up, or whether actually black will get some uh, dangerous counterplay towards my king, uh, particularly on the on the G five. And for the time being, I think those <laughs> those two scenarios are. Um, Equally likely, let's say. I'm not too uh, uh, too sure of myself here, despite the pawn. I think I should not have taken this pawn on f4. That was very stupid. Uh, I gave him a lot of counterplay, basically, for free. Mm, what to do now? So rook g8 will come, and then there will be some pressure on g2. I really played this very, very badly, to be honest. And this was an excellent move because I wanted to go here and sort of ease up on the pressure. Now I cannot. I'm even considering this crazy move G4 just to give my king some more space. I think I will do that. At the very least, maybe I will confuse him. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I did win the Blitz tournament yesterday. It was not uh, not super strong. It was more of a social uh, social event, but it was very nice. Mm. Let's see. I take. I was actually more afraid of f takes g three because here it looks very very dangerous. But after rook g one next, seems to me that I'm completely safe. Actually, I think black got a little bit too optimistic here. Mm.
what do I think about gambits? Ooh, it depends. There are so many different kinds of gambits. Like the Queen's Gambit, for instance, is, I think, even very weird to call a gambit. Because you are not really sacrificing anything. You can always win it back very soon, if you, if you wish. Uh, whereas something like the King's Gambit, you are giving up not only a pawn, but also some positional concessions in exchange for uh, a possible uh, mating attack. So it really depends. Uh, it's very hard to say in, in general. But uh, the Evans Gambit... The Evans Gambit should imprint... It's like, the Evans Gambit is, is a strange one because like, it is pretty bad. Ah, now my opponent actually is threatening mate, but I'm first checkmate. No, the Evans Gambit... Like, it should be better than it is, because it isn't really very good. I think black has very pleasant uh, quality. Probably black is even a little bit better. But you give sort of a, a flank pawn, and you gain a couple of tempi, and uh, uh, in general, it should be better than it is. It's, it's surprising to me that the Evans Gambit isn't, uh, isn't a serious try for white. Let's play now with... Uh, let's play with Batman. Batman 2007. Mm. Maybe finally I will get much a chance finally to play the move a6, an excellent move called the Magnus Queen's Gambit, which is uh, a recommendation in my uh, newest chessable course. And my opponent is going immediately for one of the most dangerous tries with the queen to b3, and then quickly bishop g5, bishop takes f6. There is a more possible, uh, more solid way to play, like here, to play c5 immediately. It's much more solid. But this is very double-edged. So in this uh, course that I made, in general, my aim was to give, uh, as often as possible, to give two possible uh, lines. One uh, more solid, let's say, maybe a little bit less risky, but easier to learn. And then one more Celtic or more risky. And here you can see that my pawn structure is quite weak, and uh, uh, I'm a bit behind in development, and in general, uh, it can become quite dangerous for black, but also very interesting. Like, I have a lot of counterplay, particularly the two bishops, very, very useful factor. Uh, and then I have the other one, which is c5 on move 5, which I consider to be very, very solid. <clears throat> but here the question is if I. Uh, misremembered my course. That would be a bit embarrassing. But it looks like I have gotten myself into... I should have played knight c6 before taking on d4, I think. Uh, because then the, my knight would not go to e2. The knight on e2 is uh, very well placed here. So here I'm a little bit worried that things are not going the way they should for me. Basically, my pawn on d5 is very weak. Let's see. How do I try to tackle this? Let's attack the queen and maybe jump to c4. Mm -hmm, this is played very solid. And now, should I play knight c4? I guess it makes sense. If b3 comes, then at least I have some dark squares. But I'm not too, uh, too happy with what happened here. Maybe even bishop g2, just giving the pawn on uh, b2 is possible. Mm. Ah, he does give the pawn. Okay, let's take it and see what happens. Am I missing something? The big idea is if he goes here, I give a check, which is very uh, annoying, probably, hopefully. Without this check, it would be a complete disaster. But uh, with the check, I'm not so sure. But now it's without increment again. It's a little bit tricky to change back and forth. Uh, basically, there is always the risk of getting flagged. Ah, queen b1 is interesting. It's a better move, probably. Because now, if uh, there is no knight d3 check, so I will play this in a very, uh, how do you say? Very provocative way. I've been playing provocative from the very beginning, but uh, 
<laughs> it's, it's even even worse than before. I think. But in Blitz, you can get away with so many things. That's the nice thing. Blitz is a very uh, a very forgiving game in some sense. <laughs> also very unforgiving in other sense. Uh, but here, yeah, at least my opponent started to think as well. Let's see. Mm, queen, okay, this makes sense, but... Uh, but how scary is it really? I mean, my 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 dream here would be, of course, to trade some uh, some more material. If I could get the queens off the board, the risk is quite small, I guess. But uh, not at all sure that I will be able to do it. Now d5 is hanging, but this now knight f4 comes. Oof! Ay yeah 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 yeah! This is a <laughs> complete disaster. I guess I will soon have to switch to. Uh, what do they call it nowadays? Uh, practical mode or flag mode might be the more proper term. At least the queens are off the board, so I will not get mated. The queens are not off the board, but now I'm picking up a piece. He had to trade the queens, and I think actually white was still much better. Uh, or maybe I'm. What is this? I thought by now I should be completely winning, but it's still completely messy. Also, I don't have that much time. Uh, but now looks like I will at least escape with my king. It's a good thing. I also should not blunder my... Yeah, this was not a great... Uh... Now white can pick up everything. Why did I go there? Oops! Ah, what, what did I do? Ah! I misclicked. Oh, ay, ay, ay. I misclicked. I went king g8 for no reason. <laughs> I wanted to play this knight d2 immediately. Now bishop takes d5. I think white is winning. And this probably not so clear. Oops. Yeah, okay, not very clean. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I think after this game, we really should have a game with increment because that was uh, that was tough. Let me see. I will play some... Uh, someone has challenged me a million times. Yeah, let's play with... They are from Canada. Shadow mate. I will play e4, hoping for e5, allowing the Royal Opus. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, that last game was so bad. Oof. Oof, I'm sorry. Sorry, everyone who had to witness that. Come on, knight c6. Yes. I'm in my course. Let's see if I will misremember also this one. Uh... Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the game. So, yeah, I mean, in my course, I decided to recommend d3. Uh... Just to play it slowly, because throughout the course, in some cases, I tried to really to uh, how to say uh, punish black if it was uh, a setup which I considered to be inferior. But against all the main openings like the Marshall, the Berlin, and so on, uh, I have decided to I decided to recommend systems based on uh, putting the pawn on d3 because they are a bit slower in nature and they are less concrete, which means that they are less likely to be. Uh, uh, like uh, refuted uh, by force or less likely to become unplayable because they are not based on, on concrete play. And also they favor understanding, which makes it, uh, I think, in my view, a more efficient way of studying chess is to base your opening repertoire understanding rather than on, on concrete lines. So, of course, in modern chess, it's far from always possible, but... Uh, like the overarching ID should be along those lines, I think. Yeah, and here there are many moves, but I decided to recommend the move rook e1, which is a little bit rare. Like knight bd2 and h3 are two more common moves. But this rook e1 is a little, it's a bit tricky. It makes it a little bit uh, different. Sometimes you can save on h3, and sometimes you can utilize the fact that you have not yet played knight bd2. So the bishop can come out to g5, for instance, 
or you can play d4 and later bishop e3, and then we'll, the knight can come to uh, uh, to d2 after the bishop. So it's a little bit more flexible. Of course, not going to change the uh, the valuation of the of the Berlin opening, but uh, uh, I mean, I like these small touches where uh, you uh, you try to trick your opponent while still maintaining the sort of same uh, positional goals, same kind of play. Let's see. Now I play it. This bishop d7 in general, I mean, it's a decent developing move, but it's not the, uh, the ambitious way for black to play. Like, the ambitious way for black to play would have been to play this knight e7 one move earlier. And then quickly try to push uh, c6 and d5. Mm -hmm. ah, I just finished my uh, Royal Lopez short and sweet. Ah, that's nice. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, I think even even the short and sweet is not that short. Hopefully, uh, still sweet. Will you be taking on the entire course? That's quite a heavy undertaking. I think it's almost 30 hours of video. I mean, very nice, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I tried to do it as, as well as possible. But of course, uh, 30 hours is also quite a lot of time to invest for one opening. Uh, but I do believe that if you are ambitious and uh, like uh, want to improve, then you will learn quite a lot by such a course. Like so in an opening as the Spanish, uh, you will really uh, like not only learn the concrete moves and the concrete plans for that type of position, but you will actually learn a lot about uh, uh, like chess in general. Because let's say here, I mean, it doesn't matter that much. In which order this knight came to g6, this bishop is it on d7 or on c8? Is this bishop already on c7, maybe on a7? I mean, it's it's all nuances that on, on higher level you will study uh, very carefully and try not to get tricked. But if you know the plans and ideas, like uh, that's that's more important. And that uh, sort of things you will uh, you will definitely get from the course. Also, this can definitely like. Now we have this position, but let's say I play c4. We can already perhaps describe it as some sort of King's Indian style position or Bogu Indian or something like this, which means that uh, uh, you will be able to play also many openings even after 1d4 much better when being familiar with uh, uh, with that. Uh, a5, yeah. So what black is doing is making solid moves, which is okay. But what has to be understood is that I do have the center. I have these two nice pawns, which does give me sort of a long-term edge. Uh, so if the game just continues normally without anything special happening, then my advantage has a tendency just to increase a little bit by each move. So what Black should probably be trying to do, if possible, is to break a little bit faster than what my opponent uh, does in this game. Because I will have a lot of moves just to stabilize my position, like bishop e3, queen d2, rook d1, are very, very easy moves to make. And for black, like if you have uh, less space, there is always this risk that sort of the moves run out a little bit. Like, uh, yeah, like this bishop went to d7, then to e6. I mean, not a blunder or anything like that, but it doesn't really sh solve the the overarching or more long-term problem that black lacks space and needs to needs to free himself. Uh, yeah, now my opponent uh, is playing. Uh, probably forgot that it was uh, a blitz game and uh, and lost on time. Uh, but at least we were uh, able to talk a bit about uh, the Royal Opus in general and this this pawn structure. That's always a nice thing to do. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, new here. Let's play a Spanish player, Jose Moya. I'm sorry for <laughs> pronouncing it probably in a terrible fashion. Uh, uh, E4. Okay, let's see if we can play another Spanish. I did play the Spanish myself 
last weekend against Niklas Huschenbet in the Bundesliga. There I played uh, the open Spanish, which is super topical currently, uh, which arises after White Castles and Black takes upon an E4. This move D3, which I, by the way, give as an alternative in my course uh, to be able to be a bit more flexible. And uh, also, yeah, one of the big reasons is to avoid specifically this open Spanish. Uh, there are many ways to play. You can play bishop c5 first, you can play b5 and then bishop c5. I chose to play in a very slow fashion. Like very traditional. This is actually how Peter Swidler himself recommended it in a, to do for black in a chess, like in, in, a, in a video course on chess 24 a long, long time ago. Like, I don't know how long actually, six, seven years. Mm. So here, usually with black, you play this move because you want to play bishop f8, but you are afraid of this pin. That's why this move by white rookie one was better than starting with knight bd2. So against knight bd2, probably I would not have to play this h6. I, so this bishop f8. And here, Svidler's idea was to play b5 and then play d5. <laughs> uh, if bishop c if bishop b3, which is uh, the move I recommend in my course for white, then d5 is very risky because this diagonal is open and also the queen is attacked. But against uh, bishop c2, uh, D5 is supposed to be uh, quite quite reasonable for black. This was also Svidler's main line back in the days. Black. Mm, so probably, I, I mean, I, I, I recommend Bishop B3. I think it's a bit more precise. Now, in general, we have like a little bit the same story as the last game, but reversed. Like I am now having the center. And now the onus is on wide to create something quickly uh, before I have time to complete my development. What I would like to do is rook AD8. And then, uh, yeah, then it's a bit, I mean, I have some various ways, like g6, bishop g7 is one way. Advancing with d4 at some point is an option. But a4 is an excellent move. Uh, it's a very good move, very thematic. If I play b4, the idea is to play a5, and then the bishop comes to a4. Uh, and if I don't, then white will take a takes b5 and open up the a file. I see that I, again, uh, talk too much and play too few moves. I'm already a minute behind, and we are playing without increments. But I have faith in my flagging skills. So A4 is good. White has the A file. That's nice. That's probably enough compensation for my center. The question is, how do you make progress with white? This knight h4, queen f3 is a very typical ID, but I think I'm ready for it. I think I will be able to play g6, bishop g7, and keep everything. Under control. And what else? If white does nothing, then I will really start to consider this move d4 at some point. Uh, yeah, knight h4 is played. I want to play g6, but actually, yeah, g6, queen f3. If I play bishop g7, then maybe some sort of capture here and f6 knight is hanging. And if I move my knight, then already some knight f5 is. No, it's Beginning to, I don't, I don't trust it. That. Okay, let's try it anyway. Let's. Actually, what do I do after queen f3? <laughs> it looks, ah, he goes, uh, okay, that's, that's good news for me. Queen f3 was a bit scary. Now I think I have enough, but I have to speed up. I definitely have to speed up. Now with the bishop here, I can take with the knight. Usually I have to take with the bishop, but here with the knight because, uh, E5, the D5 pawn is protected. Let's see. No, but my opponent is playing very well. I, this is not uh, not great for me. Yeah, I will take with the pawn. Okay, I will speed up now. <laughs> we will reach this phase of the game where it will not be too pretty. I will have to apologize in advance. Uh, so I simply need uh, to play very fast, not to get flagged. I mean, they say taking with a pawn uh, with a pawn on b6 instead of a knight is a bit. I don't know what to call it. Too optimistic, or like uh, I wanted to keep my knight in the center to be very active, but also it's a pretty serious weakness. So okay, now it's all in time. I have to just push. 
if I don't push, I might just get crushed slowly. Let's push. And see if I will get something going. I think white just blocks. Yeah. I have probably have nothing here. Finally, enough, the rook is trapped. That was a very surprising turn of events. How did the rook get trapped here? Bishop g6. I have to get Khan to play very fast now. Mm, I will, should I take on b2? I'm worried that I will just get my. Ah, he trades queens. That's nice for me. Yeah, I'm not sure, maybe, I mean, this was definitely better than the last game, which was complete chaos. Here, I think the moves sort of, I mean, at some point here, if he doesn't trade queens, if it takes with the bishop, I'm probably doing quite badly, but it's not a complete disaster. Like it was still, I think it was still, I mean, acceptable is maybe strong, a strong word, but uh, it wasn't uh, entirely ridiculous, at least the moves. Uh, but thank you very much for the game. Let's play, what is this flag? Monkey King, what is your flag? I shall, is, it, is it China? I don't know. Okay, let's try E4. A question about bug house. Wow, I haven't gotten many, uh, many bug house games uh, lately. I've, I used to play a lot of bug house. Back in the days, like 15 years ago, I played a lot. Even 10 years ago, I played quite a bit. Uh, but I have, and now I play, I don't know, a couple of times a year. But one of those times were actually yesterday evening. After this Blitz tournament, uh, we decided to play some, have some fun and play some Bug House. So I actually played Bug House a little bit yesterday. But online, I haven't played Bug House for, uh, I don't know, five, six years, something like that. At least not very much. I mean, I played the occasional game. But, but very, very little. Mm. What openings would I recommend for a lazy player? Uh, I think you have to be a bit more specific, like uh, against uh, as white or as black, against e4 or against d4. Uh, what exactly are you, are you looking for? Then I will try to uh, elaborate a bit. Wow, <laughs> blue blue play plays music with my brother. Wow, wow, that would be in uh, in Oslo then. Are you in the same band? <laughs> yeah, that that's uh, pretty incredible. To be honest. Uh, an excellent suggestion. The good night. Yeah, I've uh, the, the the good night is for those of you who don't know uh, chess themed uh, bar in Oslo. Actually, excellent. Uh, I've been there a couple. Of, I'm like, basically, I've, I'm not that often in Oslo anymore. Used to be more often uh, before. But whenever I'm there, I tend to visit the, the good night at some point. Uh, there you will always meet a lot of friends as a chess player. Mm, very nice place. Yeah, so now we have another position from the course. It's a little bit similar to uh, the previous game where I had white in the in the Spanish. Uh, the question for black, as usual with this pawn structure, is how do we get counterplay against my pawns on, on d4 and e4? And I think usually what they do is they try to push b5 and c5, and then either open up the center or, or if I close, then play on the king side. But here, yeah, it looks a little bit slow for black, and I do believe that I have nice, uh, nice control. Okay, a five, normal. Like generally speaking, you have two ways for white here. Like either you play d five and just use the space advantage. You follow up with c four, try to push all the pawns on the queen side, particularly push c five later on. Uh, what I tend to prefer in my own games 
is to keep the pawns on d4 and e4 to keep like guessing what my my intention is and then just slowly build up so here all my pieces are sort of on, on perfect squares or on at least decent squares so the question is how do i uh, make progress and i guess i will play on the on the king side this time so bishop h6 trading the bishops when the pawns are disappearing like with the pawn on g6 i mean the dark squares are are weak uh, black plays quite solidly. Should take back with the queen. And then, I mean, one typical idea would try to be to push f4. Uh, but it looks a bit slow. I'm not sure. I'm now doubting myself again. Also, I don't have that much time, to be honest. I will play d5. No, but this is now wrong. I mean, I should have played... Uh, if I wanted to play with d5, I should have done it without trading the bishop, because this bishop is more active than this bishop here. This was a bit stupid. Uh, yeah, exactly, Gbist. I mean, like knight a5, c5, I think you should play, but preferably, probably play it like much earlier, like al already on move 11 or 12 would be my guess. Is is the best way to play. So now black is trying to play for this f5 counterplay, but without. I mean, it it looks uh, very very slow for for black. I have to say. Will I be in time to punish it though? Of course, a big question. So let's see. There are a couple of different ways to handle it, but usually f5 has one big downside that the e6 square is weak. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to utilize now. Try to go knight e6 on the next move, basically, no matter what. Mm. But it's not so clear. I think this e4 was an excellent move because it restricts my bishop. Mm. What will happen now? This pawn might be very strong. Excellent pass pawn. Or it might just drop. Very hard to say in advance. <laughs> but I think this is a good uh, development for me because with the d6 pawn alive, that should be uh, should be enough. So not only this, but also sort of black's position falls together, falls apart a bit. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I can by now probably do more or less what I want. Let's go here and let's give this check. I think it will be. Tough to defend against this check. Oops, I wanted knight f6, but my mouse. Uh, my mouse skills were not good enough. Yeah, so let's just very briefly, like, I think. Yeah, like, it, it would, of course, have been better to play g6, bishop g7 immediately without first going to e7. Then you would gain two moves. Then you would have this position. Uh, I would be a lot slower. And otherwise, yeah, some, like here, let's say, uh, some knight a5, and then c5 is how they usually do it. Like, of course, it's better if my bishop is here, because then I, black wins one more tempo. Uh, but even without that, I think, yeah, or even you, maybe you start with d5, like, let's say here, b5. I make some move like bishop e3, then black plays knight a5 and try to get c5 in. So something like that would be, because this, and this is solid, but it's basically very hard for black to come up with a, with a plan after this. Uh, that's at least my my take on these positions. Mm. Let's see. Let's play with why must I lose to this? But I don't know what is the uh, to these boobs. Ah. Okay, C4. Let's see if I can try to transpose. Yes. And this time, uh, I will try to not end up in a worse position. <laughs> ah, knight f3. Not so common. Downside is that I can take and defend the pawn with, uh, with b5 later. OK, he doesn't let me. Now, knight c6. Here, my memory is already a little bit fuzzy, but uh, I think this maneuver is what I recommend. The point is that the knight is actually quite well placed on. Uh, on a5, it's very hard to kick it away, and it keeps the c4 pawn uh, alive for a while longer. So what black 
White is doing something very natural, going with the knight to take the pawn. But White has spent uh, a bit too many, uh, too, a few too many moves to, to win back the pawn. And I think I will be able to hit in the center, like with c5, uh, quite conveniently later on. Basically, this trade of a set of knights uh, is beneficial for, uh, for black. And white is having slightly, slightly more space. So, in principle, every trade should be, uh, be good for black. Now I'm a little bit conf uh, like curious here because it looks to me like this is a possibility. Ah, no, it isn't. Or is it? I mean, the point is I'm attacking this and I'm attacking this. White cannot take because there is a pin. So how? And if white takes on a5, I can take on g2 anyway. And if white castles, then my queen is hanging, but I would be able to take on c3 first. It looks to me like I'm winning material here. If I see everything correctly. I'm not... Uh... I mean, everything that happens to me in Blitz is a bit fussy, but uh, it, I think I'm probably probably picking up some stuff now. Knight e5. But this lets me take here. At least I have a pawn. Should be good news. Mm. Okay, king e2 is good. Much better than moving the rook because now rook g1 will be coming soon. Uh, on the other hand, cannot be that bad for me either. Can I actually? I mean, I'm looking for ways to trade. I think this is a good move because this knight on e5 is very annoying. Now I'm trading a few pieces. Okay, if I manage to remove the knight from e5. I will simply be a pawn up, I think. If there's rook g1, will be too slow. Hmm. Queen g1. Okay, normal move, but at least now I will be able to... At least... Proceed with, but okay, it's not so bad actually. Actually, this was better than I thought for why, because uh, this knight e4 will be an unpleasant. Like no matter if I play g6 or if I play um, short castle. Like in both cases, this knight e4 is a bit annoying. Worst case, I can just flick in this and win the dark squared bishop. Probably. I play G6. Like it looks very dangerous for the dark squares, but I know that I will be able to trade my knight for white's bishop later on. So it should not be killing me, the, the dark squares at least. Another, another question is, should I go stop this check or is this check just nothing? Bishop E7 is quite sad if I want to take an MC. No, I, I, I will not do it. But this is risky because there is check and there is rook g4. And then this bishop is suddenly not feeling too great. But knight f6 is not the only move. If I am allowed long castle, I have uh, an excellent position. How do we... Do? I think I go here and after rook g4, probably c5. Uh... F, but F, F, I mean, it's a natural move, but I don't think it's necessarily that scary for me. I was more afraid of this rook lift. Hmm? At some point I will. If you place E4 now, I will go knight B3 and take the bishop because the bishop is threatening to escape. First, actually, let's see where he goes. Yeah, because I also take this point. 
I have had lunch already, but pawns are always tasty. Let's see. I will take it. I will. Uh, yeah, but I think I have a nice one. Like, ah, uh, this could be some sort of ID for white, maybe, but. Uh, F5 is very. Ah, or F5, yeah, in some sense makes. I have this. There is now. Uh, what should I do? Ah, it's three plus two, so it would make sense for me to be a bit faster, I guess. Ah, uh, this. I. Uh, oof. Bad move. Bishops. But I'm super confused. Can I just take this? Then later I will put my king on e6. Maybe that way. Looks super weird. I'm worried now. I mean, this king f2 and then bishop comes to g5. How am I supposed to stop that? Okay, let's do it this way. But now I'm playing for the for the audience because my idea bishop g5 I want to go up. And after this check, I will continue up. And there I might get mated. <laughs> but let's try it. Okay, here now I have to give up an exchange, but at least now I'm completely safe. This was my plan. On the other hand, I like an exchange. I think why if I took the knight, it would have been quite bad for me. Now I think I have enough compensation. Hard to say. Now I have enough compensation, I think. Now the pawns are weak rather than strong. Uh, yeah, you know, probably white is losing the grip a little bit in, uh, in time trouble. Not easy to play with seven seconds. And I still have everything defended. Now even I'm starting to create some threats of my own. Here it looks like two rooks are hanging. And yeah. Now oh, well, white actually managed to play very well in this. Uh, because it looked like I was a pawn up and I had no worries at all. And suddenly it was quite dangerous come to play. I have to say. <clears throat> That's. Let's play another one. Let's play Mr. Aslan. <laughs> mm, I see. keep hearing that as a beginner, one should keep to one opening. What point do I think it's time to broaden the horizon? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Like for improving players, like let's say, what can be that level? Let's say two thousand rating plus, something like that. My uh, advice has always been to. But let's give him a few more seconds. Uh, my advice has always been to all the time try to change one opening in your repertoire. Never more, but also never less. So like, let's say uh, you are changing your opening and maybe you are trying to learn the Spanish instead of the Sicilian. Then while you are learning that, you don't change anything else. Uh, like you play uh, with white the same and against 1d4 with black, you also play the same as you always do. And then when you are done, when you feel that you have learned this new uh, thing, that you have learned the Spanish, uh, then it's time to change something else so that you all the time keep improving, but also it should not get overwhelming because I have seen many players. This is he's not supposed doesn't seem to be here, so I will start another game. Uh, mm, but also not get overwhelming because if you play or if you try to change your whole repertoire completely, I think it takes too much uh, effort and you will be confused and you will, first of all, not be in time to remember and uh, understand all the different new positions. Uh, 
and also like to remember I'm mean, everything. It, it's just too much. So change one opening at a time. But for weaker players, let's say 1600 online rating. Uh, yeah, I think it should be less. Like you should try to play proper openings. Ah, also this, what, what is this? Nobody is here, it seems. My opponent is now not here. Can I find? Uh, let's play a German player. Shout out to Germany. Mm, yes, I, I would simply say that, I mean, don't change too much, but try to play proper openings from the start. Very important. Mm. I'm a little confused why nobody is making moves. <laughs> what is this? Also not. A good solid black opening, different from the modern or pits. Mm. I mean, it's a good solid opening. It has to be one e5. That's the most solid move. If you want more drama and action, you play Sicilian. If you don't, if you want to be solid and want to have good positions, then play one e5. Play the Spanish or the Petrov. The Petrov is a bit. Uh, I mean, Petrov is is a bit sad or it's a bit passive. Maybe I'm not a big fan of Petrov for weaker players, but but the Spanish definitely. Yeah, the Jobava London, I'm... <laughs> no, to be frank, no, I think not. I mean, I, the, the, this proper opening should not be mixed up with good or bad. I think Jobava London is an okay uh, opening, like in an objective sense, and for a strong player to play it, it's, it makes some sense. But when you have this d4 and this knight on c3 ahead of the pawn on c2, which is sort of the uh, defining factor of Job Jobava London, this knight on c3 can quite often become uh, misplaced. Like it's simply much more natural to have the pawns in front of the knight. And this means that you have a bit more uh, like responsibility because the risk that you end up in, in a very unharmonious or stupid position with the knight is, is bigger than when you play d4, c4. So not, not that it's bad, but I think it's more logical for weaker players to play... Uh, let me just make some moves here. To, to play like more straightforward fashion, like take control of the center, develop your pieces to normal squares and so on. Uh, I think the normal London system, I mean, I understand that uh, it's maybe online, especially not the most popular thing to say, but uh, I believe the normal London system, there you don't have this risk of getting bad pieces in the same sense. And that I would, I would definitely classify as a proper opening and, and an opening quite well suited for... Uh, uh, Weaker players, because you get all your pieces out, very likely at least, and the plans are not that complicated and there are not that many different pawn structures that black can play. So I would prefer normal London rather than Jobava London. Uh, I mean, and, and of course, again, this is my take. I mean, it's not that I'm... Uh, what I'm saying is, is true by default. It's just uh, the way I see it, of course. Mm. <laughs> unharmonious <laughs> equals terrible yeah i mean <laughs> a little bit like that yeah or like rather not so much that it is terrible but that that it can quickly become terrible if you're not careful enough and uh well i guess simply the the lower rated you are the uh, the harder it is to be careful about such matters so a little bit too much strategic risk for my taste Thank you, Lone Wolf. Thank you. Kid Arena GM, there was a technical issue. Uh -huh. Okay, we can start. We can have, play the next game for sure. Uh, so this way, it's a bit. Should I, I should move probably. Because I have space advantage, which should mean that I should move. Uh, they should avoid trades as much as possible. I'm allowing one trade with Knight on d5, but. It's because I would be able to take back and get an even bigger space advantage. So, uh, 
like night it's very hard to uh, to not play 95 in such positions yeah Ricky Barbosa I think so I mean if you play the Jobava London it makes sense to uh, also try the normal London out then yeah I mean definitely definitely I'm not against Lon the London system in general I think it's very decent opening you can I mean London system you can also put the bishop on g5 and you can alternate between the two if you're if you want that if you're bored that's the nice thing uh, with those openings Extractions are the same, you will be familiar with them, but you can also trick your opponent by, or also avoid getting bored by, uh, yeah, like uh, changing it slightly rather than changing everything at once. I wanted to go here. If it takes, uh, I take back and the queen is trapped. Uh, but black did not need to take, as far as I could tell. But yeah, here we see a typical um, problem uh, of having less space. I have this pawn here, black has little space, which means that these three pieces in particular are really struggling very badly to get back to the king side. You want to put the knight here, and then you want to put your queen here, and then you are safe. But it will not happen because uh, I have too much space uh, blocking it, uh, which means that most probably I'm just completely winning here. Mm. Yeah, rook f7. Now it's. Uh... Okay, so I promised to play with. Uh, who was it? Ah, this. C plus two. But why are there so many challenges? That's a bit weird. I don't know if it's a technical glitch or what happens because quite often I get like multiple challenges from the same. Uh... Uh, from the same person with like a minute in between. But here it seems to be working. Okay, let's try Spanish. If I will be allowed. It's uh, always interesting. Like, when, let's say when you have made a course, for instance, or you study something from, from one side more, it's usually very interesting to sort of change the color, uh, change your perspective on. Uh, uh, on the position and uh, try to look look at it from from the other side. I think it's a very uh, nice tool for developing your game. Probably not <laughs> not that relevant for. I guess m most of you haven't made that many courses, but <laughs> like the general principle, not only courses, but also if you, for instance, uh, like just study an opening or you try to play a few games in an opening. Change the color and try try it from the other side. It's uh, it's a very nice way, in my opinion. Mm. I think it's also something that, for instance, Magnus does fairly regularly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I like my. Should I try to keep my queen there? I will try to do it. Mm -hmm. This is a typical situation where there is this tactic, like queen a4, I have to defend my bishop, and white can take on b4. But after I take back, then my queen is no longer, and there is no longer a pin, so white will be able to take. But in the end, white will have an isolated pawn on d4, <coughs> and, uh, well, the two bishops, but uh, no real, uh, like, activity to compensate for the, for the isolated pawn. So. I don't think that it's uh, it's a great idea for white. Yeah, this probably is more uh, more to the point, but I'm curious now because it seems to me that I can simply eat this pawn g2. Can I? Can I not? Looks like it, right? Queen takes b4, the rook is hanging with check. Take, I can take with any piece. So rook f1 is the only move. And then I had this idea of going here. Funny. Funny way to play. Probably not necessary, but... Actually, maybe I should just castle short. Why not just castle short? My king is completely safe. But he's thinking. 
which uh, scares me a little bit because it means I probably missed something. Uh, this. I can take with the queen. Take with the pawn. I guess his idea is to give the exchange, take on b4 somehow, but is it really enough? I mean, I know that it's not enough, but uh, um, like how easy will it be for me to play it? Okay, let's see. Let's have a look. Thoughts on the English? Uh, no, English opening is an excellent uh, opening. It's probably not the most well-suited opening for uh, beginners. Because again, I believe for beginners, it's very important to play uh, in the center as early as possible because it eliminates the risk of things uh, going too wrong. Actually, why did I not just take this guy first? It would have been easier. Uh, but for, let's say, when you reach some level of like 17, 1800, then already the English is a very interesting opening. Like If I had uh, taken on C3 first, I would have this position without White's Knight on C3. That was not uh, so impressive by me. But I still have an extra exchange, so it doesn't matter that much. Mm. I mean, the English is used very much on, on let's say, Grandmaster level or top level, because it's uh, very flexible, and you can try to trick your opponent with different move orders. You can try to avoid the most uh, well-known openings, and so on. Try to be a bit tricky. Uh, but that is only really relevant once you have reached uh, a certain level, I would say. So the English is a bit like... Yeah, it depends a bit on your level, what I think about it. Will playing the Nimsu Indian and Ragosin help I <laughs> develop faster? I mean, compared to what is the question? Like, I think studying any good opening in in depth compared to uh, compared to King's Indian. I mean, it depends uh, what you play uh, since before. Like, in general, to broaden our horizons, we should try to play a few different uh, kind of positions. If you have exclusively played King's Indian style positions in your life. Uh, then sure, play something with the pawn on d5 with pawns in the center. Makes a lot of sense. Also depends, of course, on your level. Mm. But yes, I believe in uh, in the Rogosin very much. It's an excellent opening. No, 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 no. Thoughts on the England gambit? I mean, it's a pretty bad opening. D4, E5. You take the pawn and you are much better. <laughs> I'm not sure why, uh, <laughs> why it's so popular online. But in general, I'm not... <laughs> I struggle to <laughs> understand uh, uh, many of the trends online nowadays. So you should not take my words for, for the truth there. I don't know. I think at some point we are supposed to switch to this uh, questionnaire sort of thing. Ask me anything uh, stuff. I think it's probably time, right? Uh... Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I will. we will have this Q&A uh, now. Like, ask me anything uh, stuff. Uh, I will be back in two minutes for that. We have to reset it up. See you soon, everyone.
Okay. So we are with this uh, Ask Me Anything questions. Uh, I think the link is uh, in the chat. Oh, actually, when I put the link, it was not possible. Uh, because you have to be uh, a moderator, I think. But I will have uh, the questions here at least. And you will be able to find the chat, I think, in, in just 24. Maybe the moderator will post the link. I will just start uh, answering. First of all, yeah, are you excited about the Olympiad is the first question. What was your preparation like? Uh, yeah, I mean, in the short answer is yes. I mean, of course, uh, the Olympiad was first supposed to happen in Moscow. Uh, excellent chess city. Now, for very understandable and very sad reasons, it was moved to Chennai, which is uh, not traditionally a great uh, chess city, but I think in modern times, definitely a great city. And I think uh, later on, like let, let's say in 10, 15 years, it will be probably one of the main cities for chess in the world. Uh, so uh, uh, it would be nice to be there. I mean, India is, of course, a little bit tricky for, uh, for Europeans. Uh, I will also type. I should type at the same time. Excited. I'm, my spelling in English is terrible. Uh, my preparation. I am uh, currently preparing. Just at home. Uh, mainly by studying chess in general. I am trying, of course, to have some new openings, have my repertoire in order, but also I try to be uh, uh, quite sharp. Like, so I'm solving a lot of exercises. Like yesterday, I played this Blitz tournament. The day before, I played another Blitz tournament. Today, some Blitz against viewers. Uh, and like, just, I would say regular chess training is, uh, uh, is what I'm mainly focusing on for, uh, for the preparation with the Olympiad. We have not actually had any training camp. Like for Olympians, when you play in teams, it's quite common to, uh, to have training camps with a team. It's also very nice, I think, because it really helps this team game. But uh, yeah, we have not had the time. I think the Swedish championship just finished. People are quite busy. Also, Chennai is far away and we will be there for a long time. So people also need some time off. And yeah, that's a bit unfortunate, but that's how it is. Uh, the next question is, what surprised me the most about candidates? I think uh, one thing that didn't surprise me that much, if we start by not answering the questions, was uh, Ali Ressa's uh, performance. Because I thought that the first time, and he's quite young, and he's easily bit, can become a bit too much, he will be nervous and so on. So actually, I'm not surprised at all that he didn't do it. I mean, he's, of course, a fantastic chess player. I believe that he's very likely to win the candidates in the future, but I thought it was too early for him. This was correct. I thought Nepo's experience would help him. Of course, that he won so many games was uh, surprising. Uh, Ding finishing second. Also, I mean, very normal. One of the best players, one of the favorites. So I have to say that it was uh, Bobby's performance. In the second half, like, he started very well, more or less like we predicted, and he was definitely supposed to be one of the favorites. Uh, but his performance in the second half uh, was, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened really. Like he probably felt like that's my uh, sort of maybe naive or not so educated take on what happened, that he felt too much pressure by Nepo winning so many games that he had to take too many risks and it got a bit uncomfortable. Uh, uh, for him. Mm. Let's see. What is the most popular opening? I mean, no, this is too, there are too many, uh, too many simply. I think like, if we talk, it also depends like what, what level we are talking about. I think scholars mate on certain levels <laughs> is the most popular and on, uh, on the highest level. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's your guess is as good as mine. Like, yeah, I'm not a statistician, but, uh, Berlin is super popular. Like, uh, various Italians, very popular, uh, I guess D4, I guess Queens Gambit, 
and the Catalan are the two main openings nowadays. But yeah, it's uh, it's hard to say. It's a bit too wide this question. Mm. How can we get chess to become more popular in Sweden? <laughs> okay, this is also a very big and very tough question. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard for me to uh, to answer. I think there are a lot of things that are done in general are are good. I think chess is already becoming uh, more popular. Like if you are, let's say, uh, out in public spaces, there will be much more chess than, for instance, when I started playing chess 15, 20 years ago. Like the uh, also the sort of general opinion about chess i think has improved quite a lot like now if you say that you are a chess player people are in general well i don't know impressed or I mean, yeah basically basically they consider it to be something that is quite quite good and quite nice whereas when i started to play it was mainly considered very weird and very strange so i think uh, things are already going very well i will uh, type this as an answer Chess is getting more popular. That's just my personal take. I don't know. <laughs> chess players get all the girls these days. Yeah, I don't know about that. But I mean, let's say I, I'm sure that uh, <laughs> that it's more than it was uh, 20 years ago. Mm. Let's see. Who was or is the best chess player ever? Uh, well, I mean, in, in absolute terms, of course, it's Magnus because the game is all the time improving and the players are all the time getting stronger and there is uh, a slight deflation, I think, even in the rating systems and the ratings are getting higher and higher as well. So, uh, I mean, in absolute terms, of course, it's... Uh, a modern player and uh, well currently the highest rated player is Magnus so like, he's definitely the best chess player ever but that's also quite irrelevant because what we are really discussing is who is better compared to his time uh, and that's more tricky because we have had many many dominating players uh, in the past in the past sorry uh, yeah it's it's hard to, I mean Kasparov was world champion for for 15 years Magnus is uh, not yet there. I mean, even uh, uh, not close. Of course, it's not unlikely that he will be at some point. I think it's very likely that he will at some point be the best chess player ever. Then, of course, we have Fischer. I mean, Fischer was uh, so dominating in his time uh, as well. But he played very few tournaments and it was a bit strange. Like, it was... Uh, a very different time. He's very known for his 6-0, 6-0, 0 in candidates tournament. Or he won last six of the of the candidates tournament and then in the matches 6-0, 6-0, so 18 games in a row. Uh, but in the match, it wasn't that. I mean, he gave he started with minus two, of course, and, and anyway won ahead of time. But if you look at the games, it wasn't... Uh, I mean, Spassky was fighting well as well, but... Yeah... For me, it's probably Kasparov currently. Uh, with Fischer a bit behind. And Magnus maybe somewhere in between the two. But with uh, a caveat that, uh, that Magnus is very likely to be the strongest chess player ever in the future. But for the time being, I will type Kasparov. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's, there is no real question that those three are the are the most impressive. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm reading this uh, champions, uh, this uh, questions here, so I'm not really paying too much attention to all of the other other chats at the, at the time being. Uh, but I will try to have a look as well. How does Norway, with a population of half the size of London, produce a formidable world champion? Okay, it's pretty random. I mean. Uh, Nowadays, it does not matter that much for where you come from because everything is done online. It's very easy to travel, especially if you are from Norway. I mean, you can travel everywhere. Uh, it's very affordable compared to, <laughs> to Norway. And, uh, well, it's, yeah, to my, um, in my view, it's mainly uh, just a coincidence. 
but not a very strange one. Like, okay, it has to be some. It has to be from somewhere. Happens to be from Norway. It could be from uh, from another country as well. It's not like in, uh, let's say, before the internet, where you actually had to have strong players around you in order to improve. Then it was much tougher, and it would have been a huge shocker if if uh, Norway produced a world champion. But now, it's, to me, it's not very strange. Like, mm, just a coincidence. Uh, no, next next question. Is the Roy Lopez a better opening for White than playing the Gukko piano? Mm. Is the anti in Nimsu Indian? I'm not actually sure what is meant by the anti Nimsu Indian. Is it three knight f three, which I consider the main the main move rather than the Nimsu Indian? Uh, so, but let's start with the Roy Lopez. No, I mean first of all, like with all major openings, we cannot, in ob in some objective sense, uh, talk about one being superior to the other, like. Uh, the Italian and the, the Spanish, they are of exactly the same objective value, I think. They are both very decent price for uh, for advantage. I like the Roy Lopez. I like to study the Roy Lopez because, uh, because of its history. I think it makes it much easier to study. Uh, like, let's say you want to learn this opening, you can have a look at lots of the games from the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s. Like all these great players like uh, Geller, and Stein, Fischer himself, of course, Karpov. I mean, uh, you cannot really learn maybe the Italian by studying those players because simply it was not very popular then. It wasn't considered very uh, ambitious. Of course, you can have modern games as well, but in general, when studying, like I like older games in general more because they are a bit more clear cut. What happens now when you have two good players playing against each other is that they know what they have to avoid and the fight gets very subtle, very abstract and like rather complicated. Whereas uh, Fisher could just win a game because he had a nice plan and his opponent was not aware of this plan. And so he just won and this makes for excellent educational material. Uh, so that's a big advantage of, of the Roy Lopez as, as let's say a tool for improving in chess. Uh, but the opening in itself, they are, it's of course, uh, uh, they are not really better than, than each other. I will write like this. Perhaps for studying chess in general, but not the opening in itself. Yeah, Nimsu Indian, I don't really know what to say, like Nimsu Indian or not. Like, I don't really have an opinion. Hmm. So Magnus Carlsen fan. Okay, so we are both fans of Magnus. Hello and thank you in advance. Question is, in my opinion, which chess openings offers the greatest possibility for white to obtain a draw? Mm. This is a rather sad question. Uh, like, <laughs> because why would you want to force a draw with white? But it's quite common uh, practice. Like, let's say you play a mini match, you won with black, you have to make a draw with white. So there are two. Uh, overarching strategies, I would say. Like one strategy is to play uh, very solid. To play, let's say you play d4, c4, knight f3, knight c3, no weaknesses. Uh, and once black starts to counter in the center, you start to trade pieces. Usually, the logic of chess openings is that black is trying to liquidate bit by bit, and uh, you are hoping that the solidity of your position will, uh, uh, yeah, just make the game run. The other way to do it is to play uh, which on top level at least uh, what they usually do it by playing one e4 and they play in a very concrete way like for instance if they face the knight of they will play bishop g5 it will be super sharp but the aim here is to uh, not play a super sharp messy position but to actually just force a draw basically have all the game with you in uh, in advance and if then the opponent deviates from these known drawing lines uh, yeah the point would be that your advantage is so big that even if it's messy you will be able to just win it outright so those are the two like I think Magnus played I mean he played e4 now in the match but he also in general has been playing in both e4 and d4 and so on uh, but a very nice example of the other strategy is uh, 
this year uh, in his match against Kramnik in 2008. He was at some point uh, needing only a draw with White. And before he had played 1d4 and he had played Nimsu India and he had played some super sharp Catalans, very messy, very like he won very nice games. But when he needed a draw, he actually played e4 and he actually played uh, specifically this bishop g5 Nyderf. Uh, and got a very big edge, and uh, Kramnik at some point just offered a draw because his position was so bad. Uh, so yeah, two two approaches. Mm. I will text also. Either. And it depends on. Depends, like who you are and what you play already, and so on. Uh, oh, this one is a nice question. So, why did I choose the Roy Lopez? Let's just see what people are are saying in the in the chat for the time being. Mm -hmm. Ah, Daniel Dimovsky. Ah, nice to uh, nice to see you. Some chess players I haven't met in. Uh, 15 years it's nice also yesterday in the blitz i also were able to play some chess players i haven't i haven't met for so many for so long okay let's see uh what why did i choose the roy lopez uh no first of all uh, i have played the roy lopez with both colors so i know a lot about it i thought i have analyzed it very very much uh especially from the white side also from the black side uh and why did I think that it was suitable for the for a chessable course? Well, it did have a lot to, uh, to do with, that, uh, with the fact that uh, the opening, the Roy Lopez, is uh, very well suited for, for learning about chess in general. So, like, I was thinking like this. If I am going to take a couple of months off just to make a course, then I want the viewers to get... And more than just some concrete moves and some <laughs> some computer lines and, uh, and that's it. Like no, I want if they have if they are going to study my thirty hour course, uh, they must get something uh, something more than just uh, the uh, the repertoire. They must learn more about chess in general. And for that, I think the Roy Lopez because uh, there are so many relevant structures like these pawn structures in the center. They are so often. Uh, Seen also in other openings, that it's like a very freak, frequent uh, thing to occur in, in chess in general. Like, for instance, King's Indian can be quite similar to Roy Lopez often, and, and so on. Uh, or the, the Pierce and Beno, or uh, no, no, not Beno Pierce and the modern defenses, and so on. Like, you can easily get the same pawn structures. Even the hippopotamus can become a, a Roy Lopez easily. So, so that was my main, uh, my main goal. I wanted to. Uh, share my knowledge a bit about chess in general and I thought it's easier to do that in let's say the Roy Lopez rather than perhaps something like the Nidorf where the pawn structure is very defined from the from the beginning like you will learn that very well but you will perhaps not learn a bit less about uh, about chess in general so that was the the general uh Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. It was another Dimovsky. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sorry. But nice to see you anyway. I hope your team goes goes well. Uh, so what should I type? I will type uh, to be able to uh, educate more about chess in general. Apart from only the openings. Or the opening moves. Maybe I should have tried. Uh, are you able to concentrate exclusively on your position when playing, or does your mind wander? And if so, how do you bring it back? Uh, I think uh, there is not a single chess player in the world whose mind is exclusively focused on the position for the entirety of the games they are playing. That's simply impossible. Uh, the mind is wandering, but what we are trying to do is we are trying to make it wander less and less. Uh, and that's something I think all strong chess players are working on, more or less. Uh, 
like uh, all the time. It's it's simply a very a very important very important thing. And how to how to do it? How to bring it back? Um, I think any sort of concentration exercises that you can that you can find, like whatever works for you, will be will be excellent. Like, I mean, for some people, for instance, blindfold chess is an excellent tool. Uh, for me, it's not that tough to play blindfold, but if you are a little bit weaker, it will require you to have a very deep concentration. So it's so easy otherwise to get lost in the position. Uh, I do this sometimes myself, but generally I try to add some additional element of pressure. Like, for instance, I can play blindfold blitz, which uh, helps my, uh, my concentration because with so little amount of time, I actually have to be super focused to be able to, to keep a decent level. Uh, so that's one thing. But also, like in general, just I don't know what, what the proper terms are or what sort of... Like, I've heard the term mindfulness exercises, for instance, or breathing exercises, this kind of stuff. Some people might do some meditation sort of thing. Uh, those things also helps. Mm, and yeah, as, uh, as mentioned in chat, also uh, giving the mind a short break definitely helps. Like if you play a, play a five-hour game, at some point you really should uh, take your time to... Uh, uh, yeah, for instance, get some fresh air for a few minutes or something like that. Because it's simply, yeah, it's you cannot sit there for five hours. She never asked, well, which female players do you like to reply to their games? I don't really understand the question. It's a very strange question. You did, but I, I don't understand. Reply to the games, to their games. Hmm. I tend to lose any opening middle advantage by making stupid decisions in the end game. I play five plus three, so don't practice thinking long in the end games. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're already answering the questions a bit. I think playing longer uh, uh, time controls is better. I mean, uh, especially, for instance, if you play classical chess, you typically have... Uh, and this extra time after 40 moves. And after 40 moves, quite often you are in an ending. So then you have, for instance, half an hour to think about uh, uh, how to like to think about the ending. Because if you play Blitz, then generally when you reach an interesting endgame, you have no time left. So yeah, playing playing classical chess in general, especially with, uh, with the increment after move 40, or additional time after move 40, uh, is an excellent way. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's more or less the same as with all other parts of the game. Like you can play, uh, practice, for instance, if you have a friend, play some uh, uh, training games with your friend is a nice way. Uh, like you put out, you set up some position, some interesting ending, and you play it. Then you get this practice, for instance. Uh, and also, yeah, I mean, specific book sources and so on, I'm not really too familiar with what is out there. One classic is Sherzhevsky's Endgame Manual about strategic thinking and endings. That's excellent. Another book I really enjoyed was this 100 Endgames You Must Know. But I think apart from that, I like really getting the practice in is the most important thing. Mm. Or practical experience. Oh, there are a lot of questions. I'm not sure that I will be able to, uh, uh, let's see, to be able to answer all of them. Let's try. Uh, which opening hardware? I think in general what people do nowadays, 
like the most common thing is to not have your own uh, strong computer. Let's say you have some super strong computer, it used to be the case. Nowadays, people are renting on the clouds. Like there are many different uh, servers where you can rent you can also set up your own. Uh, and they tend, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how, uh, uh, how, how, I mean, how, how fast Stockfish, for instance, is calculating it, it depends. But I would say that a serious grandmaster does not, no, it, it's, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it can vary so much and it depends so much from person to person. Uh, but they definitely use, uh, use cloud services. That's, that's for sure. It's very rare that people are sitting with their desktop and it's super strong. Simply not, uh, not efficient, I think. Also not uh, financially very, uh, a very, very good investment. It's much better with, uh, with some cloud uh, service. Mm, so... So let's see. Yeah. Am I still satisfied with my recommendations in the Roy Lopez course? Uh, should I change? Uh, I mean, for instance, one thing that I would like to change is because last Saturday, like uh, what is it? Five days ago, four days ago, I played a game with Niklas Huschenbet uh, in the Bundesliga. And there he played a very interesting ID uh, in the open against the open Spanish, which uh, I definitely would have uh, uh, recommended if I had the, the chance to uh, to make a new recommendation. So what he did was very interesting. So you can definitely check that game out. Uh, apart from that, I think my recommendations are holding up fairly well. Hmm. I mean, it's almost impossible to make opening recommendations to, uh, that you can. Like, uh, I, I mean, the, the theory always evolves, so like small things here and there changes. But in general, I'm still even myself playing my repertoire, like, at least big parts of the repertoire uh, in my own classical games. So not really, but but this Hushan Bed game was very nice. So this you can have a look at. Mm. What are the best materials for the Italian game to study? Uh, I mean, Anish made a chessable course, of course, about uh, the Italian. And when An Anish makes something, it's usually of excellent quality. So that one uh, is nice. Uh, for black, uh, well, uh, I mean, all the guys who made one E5 repertoires like Seto Raman, of course, Jan Gustafsson with his Marshall, uh, Shankland uh, with Berlin, and so on. Like they all made, and I think decent uh, work on the on the Italian. But in general, Italian is is tough because it's a lot to move others. It's very confusing, and you have to really uh, like put a lot of effort in to understand all the subtleties. The other way to do it is to simply just play. And, and sort of admit beforehand that you will not be able to understand all the subtleties and all the different nuances with move orders and so on. And just play the game because in general, the position is safe and sound for both sides and you can just play it. So like for most people, I would actually recommend just uh, getting practical uh, experience. Uh, it's only when you reach a very high level that it makes sense to go so deeply uh, into it. Let's see. Uh, what is the fastest way to erase your rating? I think you just have to uh, accept uh, that it is not a very fast process. You have to work hard for a long time and then you improve. Unfortunately, that's <laughs> that's the way I see it. There is no cheating. There is no uh, like uh, shortcut. bit of a 
<laughs> sad reply, perhaps. I don't know what, what was expected, but that's definitely what I believe to be true. How to be a grandmaster? I mean, it's the same question. How to be a GM? How to grow faster? Yeah, you have to accept that it will not be very fast. Uh, now some more. Mm. Oof. What is this? A lot of cheating. I think performance enhancing drugs are very rare as far as I know. I'm not an expert. Uh, I believe over the board cheating amongst top players is very rare. They uh, have no need. Uh, in general, I think online cheating is a much bigger problem than over the board because over the board, uh, it's much riskier, much more difficult to do it. Also, uh, I mean, less tournaments. Also much worse if you are caught. Uh, let's say. But I'm always a bit naive in the sense in this cheating uh, matters. Uh, so maybe I should be more, more worried, but I'm not. I'm, I'm an optimist here. Let's see. Okay, same person, a lot of questions. The popularity of chess has grown significantly. Yes, I agree. What changes? I mean, there are more online tournaments, more dear, more good online tournaments. That's the main uh, difference. Like now you can actually play a lot of very strong players and strong tournaments and get a decent income from playing uh, from home. That's one of the biggest changes. I don't think that it's such a big question of uh, uh, like uh, resources to become a strong player. I think mainly you have to put in the work. Uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Like, uh, mm, it's mainly, I mean, of course, for some, like I'm speaking from a rather privileged perspective where I always had the possibility to play a lot of tournaments and to travel and so on. Uh, even had some coaches. Uh, but in general, like my impression was always that for most people, uh, like when you are an up and coming player, let's say you are close to top 100 or something like that, to take the next step, I mean, you, you actually already earn enough money yourself so that you can sustain uh, a very serious training uh, regimen. And it's more... Uh, it's more a question of uh, uh, of doing the work, which is there for you just to do. So no, I I, I don't uh, I don't think so. I don't uh, really agree. My main sort of let's say uh, obstacle uh, for my career, for instance, is still also time. Like I need to do more work myself. Need to spend more time on, on training and trying to improve. So, think. Let's see. Online rating is not that relevant. Uh, I think in regards to becoming a chess uh, a grandmaster. Uh, a dream to a to, uh, professional top 10 player if you are 15 years old and have an online rating of 2700. Very hard to say. Hard to say. Grandmaster sounds reasonable, I guess. But I mean, top 10, it's hard for me to say because I was never my top 10 myself. So I don't really, I mean, I don't really have authority to speak about it. I will just say that it sounds difficult. Uh, Oh, 
Uh, let's see here. Mm, mm, mm. Swedish club player likes Fisher's King's Indian Attack. I think King's Indian Attack is an excellent opening. Uh, it's one of these openings where you have long-term play against Black's King, generally, uh, which is sometimes still underestimated a bit by the engines. or Maybe not underestimated in an objective sense, but more that it's much easier for a computer than for a human to defend against it, which means that in practical terms, it's stronger than the engine believes. So uh, in a practical sense, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice opening. The King's Indian defense, okay, similar, like, yeah, it's a decent opening, but it's more risky, of course, because white is a tempo up. Mm. Let's see. Yeah, that's basically it. Okay. Before I became... A grandmaster, did I set small goals for improvement or focus more long term goals? Uh, both, both, but not so many long term goals in general. No, I, I was, and I never had any goals in terms of uh, results. I think results based goals doesn't really make a lot of sense in chess because it depends so much on your opponent as well. Uh, but like uh, small goals for improvement makes a lot of sense. Like, let's say, you want to play some certain parts of your game better, like how to convert, uh, for instance, an advantage, maybe a material advantage in an ending, or how to not uh, become uh, like uh, super stressed when you're under attack or defend a bit calmer, for instance, could be one. Or I don't know, of course, improving some openings or improving some specific handling of, like, let's say, you know, uh, closed. Pawn structure, for instance, improve King's Indian style. I mean, you study that. Like, you have these sort of very specific uh, goals. That's That I had a lot. And I noticed, like, what was lacking in my play. But to some, let's say, some rating goal or something like this, it's to me, it's never really made any sense. Uh, okay. Like, why would you either fail or or, or succeed in, in your goal when it could be that your opponent was suddenly playing very well, for instance? And so on. No, I'm I'm not too into that at all. Mm -hmm. How do you handle setbacks? Uh, yeah, the, the like basically two and two different options. Yeah, to focus on something else or double down and study more chess. I mean, I do. Uh, generally speaking, like after a tough game, I tend to uh, think a bit about something else. Like, let's say I play an open tournament, I lose the game, I will do even some physical exercise or something like that. I don't think about chess at all. And then once the pairing comes for the next round, like if it's a closed tournament, you already know. But if it's an open tournament, usually the pairing comes in the evening before the game. And then uh, I start to prepare immediately. I start to simply focus on the next game. I think that's that's a very eff uh, effective tool. I think it's also uh, uh, what Kramnik did recommended uh, when he was still a professional player. But, uh, the best way to get over these losses is to simply focus on the future, not on the past. And focusing on the future in chess generally means preparing for your next opponent. So that I would I would definitely recommend as, as a good way. So oh, that's it. Now there are no more questions here, but is it maybe because I did not update the file or maybe that's it? Not sure what happens. Ah, no, there are so many new... Uh, I don't think I will have time to uh, uh, answer all of them, but there are a few more. Victor Nitander, I... Uh, I remember playing against Victor, not so interesting probably for the general audience. A Swedish 
international master whom I played a couple of times. He used to be a decent IM. Who do I think is going to be the next the next big name in chess? Maybe in like five years. I have really uh, uh, no idea whatsoever. In five, I mean, I don't. I, I, I have to work to keep track of the current big names, like the current up and coming players. Uh, yeah, I no idea, no idea. Or if you mean like uh, like the top, who of the already very promising and famous players will be top ten players? Let's say. Maybe that's what you mean. Then probably I will. I don't know. I think there are there are many very strong players like Eric Geisy comes to mind. Okay, Sipenko, but he's already established, like 27, 30, whatever. Okay, I will write him because he's still young. Who else? Some Americans. Niman was playing. I played Niman in the weekend. We made a draw. It was better all the game, but uh uh, he had some very interesting ideas and uh, also other games that weekend he played very well and uh, he played well. Niemann, I will have to say. But, I mean, such a list, I will forget a lot of players for sure. And, uh, maybe Abdus Satarov, he won the uh, World Rapid and Blitz. That's hard to say. I mean, I haven't played enough with them to uh, and spoken enough about chess with them to really know who is the most promising. But Okay, that's a couple of names at least. Vincent, yeah, Vincent, definitely Vincent. Mm. Although I have to say, uh, <laughs> I have to say, I played Vincent <laughs> a week ago, and he played incredibly badly, like really, really uh, poor game by him. But on the other hand, I also did not manage to beat him despite his play. So, uh, but that says more about me. Uh, and also, he beat me once before, so I have a plus, but not uh, not big enough. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. No, he's definitely very strong. Like, I just think my style is not so bad against him. Which Chessable courses are am I using for the Olympiad prep? That's, of course, a secret. Uh, but I do... I do use courses for my prep. But it's a secret which one. Can I improve in such a way that by next year I become a title player? My current classical rating is 1469. It will take longer, I think. Mm, let's see. How does it feel when you get draws, when you aim for more? You spend many hours at the board. I mean, it's part of the game. Like sometimes we we don't win when we want to win, yeah. Simply part of the game. Yeah, I mean, I never had the bigger problems with results, uh, so to speak. Okay, as I already mentioned, like focusing on on results is in general, I think, yeah, a pretty bad idea for your development in chess. So better to focus on the process and then, yeah, see what happens. 2,900, I mean, absolutely no idea. Uh, those rating numbers, it's for me very hard to understand how, how likely some things are. Uh, beginners to visualization in their head. I think blindfold chess is a good tool, which we already discussed. It's a bit about concentration. I recommended it, but also for visualization, I think blindfold is, is excellent. Uh, and if it's too difficult to play blindfold, maybe you can try to play uh, like some specific position. Like let's say you remove some of the pieces uh, to make it easier or, or something like that. I mean, uh, or you have a look like every 10th move or, or something like that to make it a bit easier. But in general, blindfold, I think is an excellent tool. Uh, uh, yeah, recommendations for clubs, unfortunately not. I mean, I haven't been to a chess club in Sweden for such a long time or at least not in Stockholm so uh, sorry about that how would I explain that uh, uh, every other book is about 296 but very few about Petrov I mean there was a book about Petrov by some Indian guy for quality chess recently 
But it's true that it's very few uh, books. I, I, I'm not actually sure. It's probably a good uh, market to take over if someone wants to make a Petrov course. Uh, I'm not a big Petrov player myself. I never tried the opening. It's not really my, my style to play, to equalize in such a forcing way. But uh, for someone who is playing the Petrov, I guess it's an excellent, uh, excellent, excellent marketing idea. But otherwise, yeah, no, no idea. Yeah, exactly. Like they say, I'm blind, blind for five moves. If 10 is too difficult, of course, yeah, you make five moves and then you look. You can also do this by uh, like reading in a book, but I prefer... Uh, I prefer actually playing because you have more always when you do when you are active you have more responsibility and then uh, you keep sharper a bit. Mm, okay. This we discussed already how to work on chess and improve in such a way. Like two years. I mean already two years is very hard to become a title player in two years. Uh, I mean you have to yes work on all aspects of the chess. Openings, middle games, end games. No shortcuts. At least in my opinion. I think let me try to update uh, once more, but then otherwise I think we are done. I think I'm also running out of time. B3, possible to play, nothing special. Have I ever gotten uh, recognized in, uh, by random persons in the street in Sweden? Yes, I have, uh, but not so much. I mean, chess is not a big game in, in Sweden. Of course, uh, from time to time, it happens, uh, happens as well. Actually, I would say that it's, <laughs> it happens more frequently in Norway because uh, in Norway, chess is much more popular, and I'm also regularly on Norwegian. I commentate on Norwegian television, for instance, and so on. So, yeah. But I'm definitely not a big star in either of the countries. Okay, I think... Uh, uh, I think that's it. It's been uh, quite a lot of talking from his side. I'm getting a bit, uh, my voice is getting a bit tired. Mm. Thank you everyone for who watched. Uh, and it was, uh, I hope you have gotten some sense of my probably quite confused answers. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Of course, you're always welcome to text me with uh, with other questions as well. But uh, yeah, I hope you, hope you enjoyed. I will try to get the producer online and see what I will do. Are you there? Okay. I think I will close. Yeah? Uh, okay. Should I say something uh, final or are you already? Okay. Yeah. No, but I'm done. I think it's, uh, it was enough. <laughs>